Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. My name is Gary Heil. Today's guest is Kat Cole, President, Focus Brands North America. In that capacity, Kat's responsible for the development of brands that include Schlotsky's, McAllister, Jamba, Cinnabon, Mo Southwestern, all places where in the spirit of full disclosure, I've spent far too much time as a customer. She's in the past been the president of Cinnabon. She's a volunteer around the world supporting women's issues for education. She's a member of the United Nations Global Entrepreneur Council. In her spare time, she is an investor and an advisor to technology companies. And Kat is among the best in the world as an advocate, eloquent and passionate about the idea that ordinary people in the right environment are capable of greatness. Kat, I am excited that you're with us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Hopefully I will live up to that description. <laughs> <laughs> well, to begin our discussion and provide context for it, I thought I'd like to take you back to January in 2011. You've just been promoted at 32 years old to the president of Cinnabon. Yeah. And I was, as I read that, I'm thinking that's got to be pretty exciting at 32, a global brand your first presidency, until I turned around and looked at the hill you were looking at. I mean, I cannot put myself in your shoes, but I'm looking at it and saying, it's franchisees in 61 countries. It's customers who can only visit you at once in a while because you're in airports and malls. Right. Not really good growth numbers in terms of the franchise over time, which means underinvestment usually. A bunch of small businesses that very difficult to get on the same page and with all the challenges you're trying to sell a large delicious yummy but 800 plus calorie cinnamon roll to a bunch of health conscious people with each passing day they become more health conscious have i missed it and <laughs> the it, only the I'm, only part of the uphill battle i would add is that it was um right at the tail end of the recession so to oh, to that, compressed discretionary income, much fewer people traveling and shopping. So that was just the, the frosting on the bond, if you will. <laughs> the hill wasn't big enough. Yeah. And, and, and so it had to be one of those days where like the good news, um, the president, and the bad news is, oh my God, what a hill. Yeah. And all you did, it seems to me, over the next four and a half years was grow it from $300 million to $1.3 billion. <laughs> One of the most interesting growth stories of the last decade. And I'm thinking, I've got to know, when you're back in 2011 and you're looking at that hill, how did you think you could create a common sense of purpose among all those stakeholders to try to make this happen? You know, I think part of the way that I felt confident in the business and the brand, you know, two different things, but related, the business and the brand's potential was just in how good the product was and is. It is incredibly differentiated. It is a cinnamon roll the size of your face, but it is also <laughs> gooey gooey and, and, I mean, truly delicious, like worth the discretionary calories. And so you, you're never at a disadvantage when product is that good. And the other confidence building piece was the strength of the franchisees. There were you know, business partners that had been through a really big rough patch through the recession. We're seeing all the dynamics you described in the marketplace, yet they were committed to the brand and they executed this fresh baked from scratch all day, every day product with excellence. And so when you have a foundation that good, it's not hard to sort of reconstruct and, and edit the house. And then add to it, there were members of the team that were equally as passionate as the franchisees. And so all the, all the ingredients of good stuff to come were there, 
they just weren't necessarily being mixed in the right way and baked at the right temperature and pulled out at the right time. Um, so, so the things that were required seemed obvious. And at least after I got into the business a little bit, going into it as a new leader, I had no idea. I was just happy to be there. I was happy to be a president of a global brand. <laughs> but once I got into it, um, it was pretty clear that leveraging what was already there to ask different questions and making some tough and sometimes not popular decisions to drive growth, um, but also improve the business model in such a tough environment. Um, those things seemed pretty obvious and the basics of what was needed to get there were already there. Give us a few ideas about how you did it. Yeah. One is just believe. I diagnosed um, the patient as having a deficit of belief. The franchisees were passionate, but they were waning in their enthusiasm. The team had been completely beaten up with several years of declining sales. Um, mall traffic declining. Remember, this was before e-commerce boom or right at the beginning of it, the what is called the retail apocalypse, which has definitely not been that dramatic, was only just beginning at that time. And so the problems were more economic than they were channel or retail driven. So first was I just believed. I went to the franchisees and talked about how powerful the brand and the business is. I rallied the team and showed them belief and vision and possibility. And I went um, on national media, international media, and talked about how powerful the brand is and all the many ways it was already doing more than people realized. And that belief, the diagnosis that there was a deficit of belief, and then leading with almost blind belief was the first way um, that I approached it as a leader that was a piece of the puzzle. The second was being really honest about our capabilities. There was an opportunity to expand the business and the brand, but there were certain things I had to acknowledge were true. It had taken 20 plus years to get us to where we were, and that was a, a, a long time that I didn't have to wait to double the size of the company. It needed to happen in a different way, not just malls and airports. So we pulled forward innovative business models, not just innovative products, innovative business models, accelerating store within store concepts, putting a little Cinnabon inside of Schlotzky's that had already started, we accelerated it. Putting Cinnabon products in grocery stores on other restaurant chains menus. These are things that restaurant companies don't do, right? Restaurant companies typically view grocery brands as a competitive occasion or other restaurants as competitors and, as a brand and a team, we agreed there was such a thing as co-opetition, that there were partners that weren't, that were potential partners, but were viewed as competition. And we thought there was a way that we offered something distinct. They had distribution that would take us way too long to build. And if we could add value to each other's business, there was something real there. And that is in part how we doubled the size of the company was through those alternative channels. So that was the second way is a really non-traditional view of business model innovation. And the third was leveraging the scale and the experience of the parent organization. There were several other businesses in the portfolio that were run by other presidents. And there was an opportunity to have the humility and the curiosity to pull best practices in franchising and product cost and distribution and technology uh, that previous leadership hadn't fully taken advantage of. So those are, there were many things we did, but those are three uh, key areas of accelerating the growth of the business out of a very difficult time. Take the first one, the belief part of it. The research in optimism is pretty clear. Optimistic people tend to live longer. They tend to have better immune systems. They tend to accomplish more. But the downside of optimism is usually they don't see reality very well. But you seem to be one of these pragmatic optimists that are gifted with being committed to reality at the same time having a belief that you can do almost anything. Yeah, I have often used exactly that phrase. I am a practical optimist or a pragmatic optimist. And, and the, I think the trick is not just being at a fixed place in terms of reality focused or possibility focused. It's another way I think about it. It's what's the reality versus the potential or the possibility. So pragmatism versus optimism. Um, it's knowing when to turn them down and up. And that I learned in my early days opening restaurants and communicating to different groups of people. There, 
just because there is a, a, a list of things that are possible doesn't mean I need to focus on all of them at one given point in time. And, and things we're going through right now uh, are an example of that. There's a ton of possibility in the world of retail, but my franchisees of mall-based locations aren't necessarily experiencing all of that possibility right now. And it's not uh, thoughtful or emotionally intelligent or empathetic leadership to focus only on the possible. Right now, they need their leadership to focus on the reality, on the pragmatic side of the business, but not forget to bring in the, the, the possibility. So I, yes, I am a, a practical or pragmatic optimist, but at any given point in time, that scale may shift a bit based on what the humans need uh, or the situation or the market uh, dictates. But you optimists are only one third of the population, which makes you very annoying to the rest of us. Wow. But how? <laughs> but how does how how do you lead other leaders into that mindset? Because the research is pretty clear. We can become optimists. Yeah, um, I lead other leaders with that mindset by asking questions. Leading other leaders means they need to lead, <laughs> and telling them to be more positive or to focus on the bright side moves no mountains. <laughs> so um, I have learned in some cases by getting lucky, other cases um, by mistakes. And, and remember, I wasn't always a leader. So I remember being led by other leaders. And even as a leader, I have bosses, I have leaders. So I, I am the recipient as well as the deliverer of leadership on a regular basis. And I'm constantly trying to pay attention to what it feels like to receive in order to improve how I give. <laughs> and um, for me, it's asking the right questions. And sometimes the questions are about perspective. So if I notice a leader is in too much of a, a practical place and not bringing forward the optimism that I believe is required in the moment, then instead of saying, you need to cheer up, buddy, <laughs> you know, or you need to smile, <laughs> I'll say, um, how does this compare to the competition? What are some examples where this is worse and why? And just ask the question so that leaders can lead themselves in order to be better leaders of others. And, and I have the opposite, as you pointed out, it can be annoying. I have some leaders that are overly optimistic uh, when they need to face reality and maybe there's a disconnect between them and their teams at any given point in time. And so I will need to ask them questions or share stories that force them to confront reality. And then again, ask questions, you know, what might be a better way to connect to the reality of your teams without losing the vision you're trying to convey and leading through questioning. It's not that I don't direct. Sometimes the situation calls for a very directive communication, but, but what I have learned is good leaders, certainly great leaders, but just good leaders respond very well to being led through the range of optimism and pragmatism through humility and curiosity of asking the right questions. Humility and curiosity, key. It's true in all that, I believe, and I, I, I wonder how you see this, that no matter how your team works, they can't fake it. I mean, if leadership is a, more a reflection of who you are than some set of styles, then you have to feel optimistic, you have to be optimistic, it's the way you have to be, isn't it? Yeah, I, it, it is. Um, but I think great leaders, and I've you know, learned this over time, also keep a pretty open circle of truth tellers around them. And even if I am, I am who I am, right? even if I am bringing forward the bright and shiny side of a coin in a moment, my hope is that I have built a team of people who say, that's not serving us right now, or um, you're, you're missing an opportunity here to connect. And so I'm still being me, but I'm getting regular feedback of how to turn my personality up and down. There's a difference um, between being someone you're not and having the command of your style that allows you to turn things up and down out of respect for what the moment and the team and the people need. Along with that optimism goes accountability, I would think. I've never seen a great leader who isn't big on knee-knocking absolute accountability for a high standard. That must be part and parcel of your way. 
It is. And, and I do think for those that lean toward optimism, sometimes that can be a bit difficult, if not well practiced, of how can I authentically, if I'm more positive or optimistic, hold others accountable, especially if it's been ingrained in me with old school leadership that accountability means military, right? It means I am going to come down on you hard and fast for everything um, that you are supposed to do. And, and not only am I a pragmatic optimist, but I am deeply empathetic, um, probably to a fault in the earlier days of my leadership because an over-exercising of empathy leads to a reduction of accountability, right? It's, I, I think of the many reasons they might not have gotten something done or maybe I accept excuses uh, a little more than I should or I hear something and I don't hear it as an excuse. I hear it as a justification and, and leaders who over-index on on deep, authentic, sort of intuitive empathy might make those mistakes I certainly did as a young leader. So for me, I reframe um, what failure of leadership is. I have learned to tell myself and others, I am failing you if I don't challenge you on doing what you've said. I am failing you if I allow something not done to go unaddressed. I'm failing in my role um, as a leader, if I don't hold this person accountable for their part, because it actually puts far more work on this person. So I've, I've learned to use this phrase, I would be failing you if. I would be failing you if, and then I fill in with what might be um, a big, heavy, directive discussion around accountability, but it is framed with why I'm doing it, with my perspective that it's wrong for me not to have this conversation. And, uh, and it's not just a phrase for me, it's a deeply held um, belief. And it is a filter that colors what I hold myself accountable to and how I connect accountability to the types of interactions that are required to drive it. You know, I, I have shamelessly stole one of your stories as a best way to explain something. I think you and I have spent some time in the last couple of years around technology in Silicon Valley. And the old startup mantra is most companies don't die of malnutrition, they die of indigestion. And that a lack of focus is a bigger part of most of our problems, right? Yeah. I, I remember Pat O'Donnell at Aspen that told me if you're preaching more than one gospel, you're confusing to most people. But your story about being in Africa and looking at what focus really looks like I think I might have, after the first time I heard that, forgot everything I knew about focus and I talk about one. <laughs> yeah, Tell us. I, I, um, I was, I think I was in my mid to, I was in my late 20s, I think, um, in or early 30s and in Eastern Africa with some friends on a humanitarian visit. So we were going with a group uh, with an organization that has the mission to help people help themselves in the most difficult parts of the world. And in this case, we were in um, Somali, Ethiopia. So in Ethiopia, on the Somali border, very dangerous area, um, incredibly poor, all kinds of sort of terrorism infiltration. And there are many organizations, military and civilian, that go to this area of the world to help them support themselves, because if they can't support themselves, they are far more likely to be forced to participate in globally dangerous activity. And so it's important, um, it's an important place to, to go be a helper. And we were sitting around with a group of village leaders that had accountability for different areas of village transformation, um, health and hygiene, education, nutrition, water, you know, things like that. And a friend of mine who was there who had never been to this area of the world, I had done a lot of work in Rwanda prior, but this was my first time in Ethiopia. And a friend of mine asked, uh, okay, we're gonna go back and we're going to fundraise for you. And this is a, a matching model. So whatever we raise and contribute philanthropically, they must contribute and then they do the work. And so we said, what are your priorities? Help us tell your story. Help us go back and talk about what you need. And the village leader, uh, they speak Amharic. It's the oldest, one of the oldest spoken languages in the world. So everything takes a moment to land because it's gotta be translated into two languages to get there. So he asked the question in English, it gets translated, what's your first priority? What are your goals? 
what's your number one priority? And they, they responded, water. Getting access to water, getting water clean so that we can drink it and use it, getting water to the, the places where the soil is best for um, fruits and vegetables, it's water. And my friend wrote it down and he said, great, um, what's your second and third priorities? Give us a list, as so often we as the as citizens of the developed and privileged world do, right? Give me the list of all the things. And once that got translated back, the question of what's your second priority and what's your third priority, their response needed no translation. It was laughter. And they said, our second priority is water and our third priority is water and our fourth priority is water. If you build us a school, if you teach us about uh, health, if you provide education, it won't do us any good if we can't get water to our plants, if we can't have clean drinking water, if we don't have access to water. And I thought, it, I mean, in that moment, it was, I was appreciating the, the focus that they had, but I thought to myself, how can I in business have that level of clarity of the one thing that is the most important, that is the greatest enabler, that if you just do the one thing, everything else after it will be more effective. And it was clear because for them, the penalty, the punishment for getting that focus or that priority wrong is pretty severe, right? It's, it's death. It's members of their family having to do horrible things in order to just get that one thing. And so I understood why they were so clear. And we in the developed world have all our lists and all our things, and we um, are paralyzed with indigestion, if you will. And, uh, and, and so it became my mantra. What is my water? How can I look at everything through this lens of forcing myself to at least rack and stack, at least find out in any given moment, if I did only one thing, what is the thing that is most likely to enable all the other things? And that has allowed me to bring a level of focus to my personal life. Of course, that one thing is health and wellness. Um, it has allowed me to bring a level of focus to my teams, to how I think about initiatives in the business with fixed resources. And I'm still not amazing at it, but I'm far better because I think, what is my water? How do I force myself to have clarity? And part of it is I have to pretend that the penalties for getting it wrong are more severe than they are. The reality is the penalties for getting it wrong are in fact severe. They lead to long-term damage of teams and companies but we're so privileged in the developed world that we don't see those penalties as acutely, as quickly as say a village leader in Ethiopia if they spend time building schools versus getting access to water. So what is my water is uh, a phrase or a way to talk about priorities that matter. It's, it's a brilliant way. And I find myself questioning how I might think about it better after hearing your story especially in a world where innovation seems to be the currency of the future, much like you did at Cinnabon, I still have to have water and innovation simultaneously. And sometimes, this was the case for Cinnabon, the bigger picture was that innovation was the water. The fundamental business model was on a very clear path to decline. And the only thing that would bring in um, more momentum fast enough were these alternative channels. So of course, I had to keep the lights on, right? But that, that didn't take a lot of energy. That didn't take a lot of focus. What took a lot of energy and focus and therefore was a priority were these alternative channels that were not only going to be the new thing, but they were actually going to enable the foundational thing. And I had that clarity. I was crystal clear. There was no money tree. There was no one, you know, I'll tell you who a bank was not gonna give a loan to in 2011. An individual first time business owner operating a franchise selling sugar and fat based in a mall. And that, that reality, I knew that the fundamental construct of the business did not have its own momentum. We had to create it with showing up where there was far more demand and far more potential for partnerships that would bring capabilities to bear, that would grow the business. And then we could use those revenues, that brand awareness, the marketing to actually fuel the, the foundational or the legacy 
business. And sometimes leaders feel like they have to make a choice. Am I running an innovation business or a legacy business? One does not have to happen at the expense of the other, but you should be really clear if one is needed to fuel the other. We just finished the study, Kat, in which we were interviewing leaders for almost a decade, and we found that one of the biggest impediments, if not the biggest impediment to moving forward was the existing culture in which they were leading that was cemented by their past successes. And so I'm not sure of the origin of your hot shot idea, but the idea that you found a way to frame what we need to do tomorrow to circumvent the existing culture I thought was brilliant. Tell us about hot shot. Yeah, you know, when I was growing up um, in restaurants and franchising, I worked for some incredible people. And so I had a lot of internal leaders who are a huge part of the reason I've been able to do what I've been able to do as a leader. But I didn't have a lot of external mentors. Um, and I had to figure out a, a way to challenge myself. And I remember I was working as a waitress in a restaurant and the corporate office came in and celebrated that general manager. And the reality was that general manager was a horrible leader, but sales were up, the restaurant was booming, but what they didn't take into account is that there were construction, there was construction activity all around the restaurant. That restaurant would have been busy with the worst manager in the world because there was so much demand. And as an employee, I saw the wrong thing celebrated. I saw the wrong thing used as a marker for success. And, and that is one tiny story, but there have been many after that I have learned to question success much more than failure. Failure, usually it's obvious, right? Everyone goes after and tries to explain it, but understanding success and, and doubting your own rationale for it and, and convincing yourself there's something I'm not seeing. There is something I don't know. I don't know the true truth is a very healthy way that can be used in an unhealthy way, but using it in a healthy way is a, is such a powerful filter to have as a self coach on your own performance and on your business. And so that was one of the drivers of coming up with the hotshot rule, which is essentially the willingness to look at your circumstances as a different person with fresh eyes and then to challenge yourself to take action in the way you would if it were day one. And to your point, culture is built by successes and we are all blinded by our own progress. And um, the longer I've been somewhere, the more likely I am blind to the greatest needs of the moment because whatever worked previously is likely not the solution for tomorrow. And that is increasingly true as the world moves faster. And so those dynamics led me to just I, I became afraid. I was afraid of sitting still. I was afraid of getting stale. I was afraid if I didn't have a lot of coaches and people to tell me from the outside that I wouldn't know what other people knew and that I could be easily upgraded and replaced. And so I thought, well, who is an awesome person that could do a better job than me? I envision um, a person. Sometimes I think of a genetically modified version of my favorite leaders, or I think of just one person I admire. And in a healthy way, not a fearful, oh my gosh, I'm going to be out of a job way. I envision them in my role tomorrow as if, you know, no notice, I'm just gone. They're in my seat, my actual seat. And I ask myself, what is one thing that they would do immediately? The first thing they would do differently and better, because all of us have been that incumbent. All of us have come behind some other consultant, some other leader, and it's day one for us. And for what's so funny is the person we're replacing left thinking, this is the best it's ever been because they did make it better. And we join day one and think this is the worst it will ever be. How <laughs> can 24 hours separate the perspective of it's the best it's ever been and this is the worst it will ever be? And the reality is both can be true. It can be the best it's ever been. And if you are a really good self-coach, it is, it is simultaneously the worst it will ever be. And so I asked myself, what would that person do? That objective thinking helps me come up with the answer if I allow myself to really do the exercise. And then I asked myself the question, why can't that be me? And the reason it, it isn't me is I am blinded by my own progress or I feel confined by the way I'm perceived. Maybe the thing I need to do differently 
is a pretty big departure from recent decisions I've made and how will people view me if I change my mind? Or um, what will they say if it's what they've been asking for anyway? And so those fears of being judged keep leaders from changing, progressing and evolving because they feel bound by their own reputations. And the hotshot rule just allows me to keep breaking out of that. I used to do it quarterly and then it was so effective monthly. And now I do a version of it almost weekly. Uh, my husband and I have a version of this check-in where we ask each other questions to reflect on objectively so we can improve. But the power of the hotshot rule isn't just asking the question and answering it, it's acting on it. So I take action on it within 24 hours, whatever that thing is that I think the hotshot would do, and I tell my team. And it demonstrates vulnerability. It says, I'm never done. It says, I'm willing to be wrong and change. And it shows a bias for action. And and when you do it enough, people get used to it. And it's like, okay, I, I, I'm not doing this as well as I could. I'm changing it, moving on. Next, next, next. And we just get a little bit better on a regular basis. And there's something about that cadence of asking, answering, and acting uh, that drives really accelerated personal and um, business or team progress. You know, there's a version of that that came to mind when I listened to you. When I was hanging out in businesses like yours years ago, I used to walk into a restaurant and I used to go, the front line doesn't lie. So all I need to do is ask two questions and the front line server, in my case, would describe the culture of that restaurant within five minutes to a T. I used to go, what's it like to work here? And they go, oh, my boss, oh. <laughs> what's the food like? Oh my God, you should know the food. Here's what's good, here's what, don't order this. You, you know how that works, right? And so I'm wondering if it isn't just a almost version of the hotshot rule for leaders at almost every level to go to the sound of the customer and listen to the frontline worker because right. they just don't lie. Yeah, you know, one of my, Probably my favorite story is something that I tell almost no matter the audience because it is as foundational as you just beautifully described is um, when I was nine years old, we, my mom came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving. And what she meant was we were leaving my father. He was an alcoholic, um, sweet dude, bad husband and father. And <laughs> I had been in three car accidents by the time I was nine years old. So I knew it was bad. And my mom, as you can imagine, um, she was, didn't have a lot of money on her own. I had two younger sisters, so she's a mother of three girls, uh, was fearful of making this decision to leave and be a single parent, not to mention telling me that this was the decision. And when she told me at the age of nine, I didn't cry and I didn't get upset. I thought and said, what took you so long? And the, the mm. business lesson in that is that the people who are closest to the action, the server in your example, me, the mm. daughter in, in one example, and then mm -hmm. my frontline, uh, so for any business, the call center, um, the service tech, the, the server, the host, whoever it is, whoever is closest to the action, and in business, that's the transaction. Whoever is closest to the action knows what the right thing to do is long before the leader does. And so the trick is, as a leader, doing what you did, asking, staying as close to the people who are as close to the action in appropriate ways as often as you can so you compress the amount of time and space between when they know and when the leader knows. But the issue with the people who are closest to the action is they lack two things that leaders have. They lack the language to articulate the problem or the solution in a scalable way, to your point, that waitress would have never said, let me tell you about the culture here, right? What they said is, <laughs> the food's not great and the manager's not awesome. And, and that tells you, you know how to ask the question to pull out what you're really asking is about the foundation of the culture and the business. Uh, so, so people closest to the action don't have the language to articulate the problem or the solution in a scalable way. And they don't have the authority to do something about it. The leader does. So we have to do what, what you did, which is go in and ask questions and be close and be accessible and have a build a culture over time that's open to feedback loops. So you're constantly pulling those patterns of replies together to say, ah, I know what my water is, right? I know I am very clear after asking enough of these questions, what the patterns of things are that are most likely 
to benefit the team or the business. And then I can go articulate that in a scalable way and command the resources against that initiative that, oh, what do you know? The food gets better. <laughs> the manager is not as bad. Um, but that staying close to the action, especially in companies that have hyper growth, and they start moving farther and farther away from the customer and there's no longer the founder mentality, there's the corporate bureaucracy and mm -hmm. you know, we've all seen it and lived it and uh, know the stories, but it actually isn't hard to break that cycle. Um, but it does have to start at the top um, of, of really prioritizing the experience and the lives and the beliefs of those who are closest to the transaction, which is usually your frontline employees and your customers. I have one other issue I want to make sure we, we get out because I haven't heard it for years. I used to work in a business that helped educate baseball players a long time ago. Oh, cool. And I had an ex, well, I had an ex pro player used to use this term. I thought it was brilliant at the time. He used to say, no matter where you get your information, you have to be your own best coach. You can't trade your mind for somebody else's mind. And then fast forward about 25 years and I see Cat Cole go, be your own best coach. And my ears perk up and go, I've heard that before. What do you mean by that? You know, I, here, let me first say what I don't mean. What I don't mean is that there isn't value in external coaching and feedback. That is critical. Even that baseball player had coaches that he needed. Um, so I, I do want to establish that by saying I need to be my own best coach doesn't mean that I don't believe external feedback and coaching is not critical. I believe it is. But I believe there is a, a space of um, motivation and clarity to improve that, can, that is best filled by coming to a perspective myself. And that if I don't build my own muscle of seeking the truth, then I am solely dependent on others, to the baseball player's point, to lead me. And what happens if I don't have access to those resources? So many people in the world don't. I didn't when I was earlier in my career. And so if success, whatever that means for any individual, is dependent on access to others to lead you through, there's a whole lot of people that are gonna be left behind. And I don't believe that that's true. So for me, it means that there is a critical role that I play for myself in being obsessed with seeking the truth, which is a constant better way of doing things, a truth that serves me today and tomorrow, not being stuck in what worked for me in the past. And, and I think that's driven by this phrase, I've used it to transform brands and teams. It's a filter through which I look at so much of the world, but my mom, um, especially as I was growing up in business and getting a bit of um, media coverage, uh, she was like, okay, you know, the typical mom, don't get too big for your britches. But the way she would say that <laughs> is a version of this phrase, which is don't forget where you came from, but don't you dare ever let it solely define you. My story, my dad, my roots, it's all a part of the fuel for who I am. The stories of my mom feeding us on a food budget of $10 a week and working three, I mean, that was all formative. I don't run from it, I don't hide from it, it's fuel. At the same time, I'm not bound by it. I will not let it be my anchor. And that, that belief system and the continuous over the years drivers to keep um, learning and evolving and growing best comes from me. Uh, I need the outside perspective. I believe greatly in checking in and soliciting feedback and asking questions that give people the permission to be as candid as they possibly can be frequently, both the people around us personally and at home, uh, our family and our loved ones, but certainly in business. But I also believe that if I don't have my own constant dissatisfaction with the status quo, if I don't have my own belief that even my truth might be outdated, I am missing a critical piece of the puzzle. Let's talk just for a second about your remarkable journey, because to say your journey has been remarkable would be to seriously underestimate how remarkable your journey has been. Um, you talked about your mom and your dad, but you started working in the restaurants 
in your late teens. And by the time you were 26, you're sitting on the executive team of an $800 million business without a college degree and much formal education in those ways. Uh, that is remarkable. That makes How it sound happen? so much fancier than it felt at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is remarkable. You know, I, um, it's remarkable because it's worth talking about, but it, it wasn't, it was unique in its own way, but there was a lot about it that wasn't particularly unique. There were so many people and still are today who start as dishwashers or waitresses and work their way up. What is remarkable is the age at which I did it and the level, you know, instead of just staying in the, um, and moving up, running my own restaurants, which in and of itself is a big career path, I ended up moving into corporate at 21. I took a pay cut. I made more as a waitress than I did in my first corporate job. And some people won't do that. Some people can't do that. But I that was, was almost a, almost a 50% pay cut, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I made 20. <laughs> uh, I might get this wrong. It was 21 or $22,000 pre-tax. That was the salary. And I was making double that as a full-time waitress. And... Um, and, and keep in mind, I had to shift from living off of cash and being able to pick a shift any time I wanted to going to living off of a paycheck. So I got a little credit card debt and had to learn that lesson as well at the age of 21. <laughs> um, it's for another, another podcast, another session. <laughs> and um, I learned a lot of lessons the hard way, but I was willing and able. I was single. I was young. I had no expenses. And so I moved to Atlanta and I took this corporate job of this growing restaurant company of Hooters Restaurants. And um, the, I think part of that remarkable journey, yes, part of it is me, absolutely. I'm curious, I'm humble. I, I have the ability to display confidence and courage at the right time. There are some things that are just a product of my mom and how I was raised and having to be a leader at a young age. But the other part of it is I joined a growing company. If a company is growing quickly, they give the people inside disproportionate opportunities. I benefited from being in a high growth environment. And you can't remove that from the equation. And I had leaders who believed in me, who gave me a chance, either because they had to, it was Hooters restaurant. So it's not as if there were Wharton MBAs beating down the door to come take <laughs> management roles at the company. Um, there were a lot of us who moved up from within. And oh, by the way, every leader I worked for, up until the point that I worked for the CEO as a 26 year old vice president, Every major boss I had was a woman. And what is interesting about that, I don't think that's required, but what's interesting is I had so many models of leadership, of women in leadership, that by the time I became an executive and had the proverbial seat at the table, I wasn't trying to figure out how to be a woman in a man's job. I had seen women be leaders. So I didn't have that emotional burden that so many women have when they finally get that seat and they look around and go, oh man, how, how do I figure out how to behave like other leaders who in many cases, less so these days, um, but in many cases happen to not look like me. And some, especially when they're young leaders, mistakenly feel they need to alter their personality to um, level up or to compete or to, um, to have a seat at the table. And I had the good fortune of not needing to worry about that because of the amazing women, general managers, district managers, vice presidents that I worked for, the person I succeeded at to be my first president, to have my first vice president role um, was an incredible woman that I had worked for for years. My first general manager at Hooters was a woman who herself had been a Hooters girl. And so it's just interesting that part of that remarkable journey um, of which a piece of the story is I moved up to be an executive of a $800 million company at the age of 26 is, is how it was relatively easy because I had the mentorship and the leadership examples of many others who were more like me in some ways than not. And that is um, why I'm so passionate about how representation matters in leadership. Um, but it's a part of my story that's not often told or there's not an opportunity to to get that in, and I, I think I benefited from that. Yeah, and part of it has to be 
just this crazy woman who believes she can do anything because the part of the story that blew me away as I started to think about it was, you know, if somebody came to me and said, you know, I really don't have much education. I have a few semester hours of college and, you know, I, I think I need to promote, I think I need an MBA. I think if I said, you know, okay, just skip college and go ahead and apply and get your MBA, people would look at me like I just fell off the turnip truck. But that's exactly what you did, isn't it? Yeah, I have a master's without a bachelor's, um, rare but possible. And here's what I hope viewers take away from, from your great question. It is not that I believe I can do anything. My mom, like many other parents said, you can do anything. But I also can't go play in the WNBA. I can't actually do everything. <laughs> I can't actually do anything. But what I have always believed is that I can figure anything out. I don't believe I know it. I don't believe it's certain I can do it well. I do believe I can figure it out. I have, the irony is what I have confidence in is my curiosity and humility. I have absolute conviction that in any situation, I can be humble enough and curious enough to figure it out far more than the average bear. And all I need to know is that there's a seed of it being possible. And there is a woman who over many um, calls and, and, and outreach who became a mentor for me over time, still is today. And she just cared. She um, came to know me and just reached out once in a while and would give me suggestions and ask questions. And um, one day she said, you know, Kat, if you, you're, you're an executive in a big restaurant company, you're very active in the industry. If you want a job in this industry, you'll never have a problem. You have a, you, you have a reputation. But if you ever want to go outside of the industry, and again, this is, I think, less true today. Um, this was 2010, 2009. She said, if you want a job out of this industry, if you want career diversity, you're going to have to have an advanced degree. And I said, you know, I just, I've tried to go back and finish my classes. Online education was finally getting more accessible at that time. Like, but I just can't, I'm, I'm an executive in this growing company. I'm traveling all over the world um, for work. And I just don't have the time. And honestly, I didn't have the interest. It's not as if I needed it for the great job that I had. And, um, and she said, you know, I know an executive that took um, their GMAT and their GRE, found some executive programs and has completed a full master's in business without an, uh, a bachelor's. And that's all I needed to hear is that it was possible. And I applied to those executive business uh, programs, got accepted to several, chose the one that felt the most connected to me, which was Georgia State. And I completed, uh, and, a master's in international business through their executive MBA program without a bachelor's. Amazing. You know, the, the part of that that just strikes a chord with me is this idea of you can learn anything. You can learn it. There is this curiosity yeah. in interesting leaders that doesn't die with age, doesn't calcify, just gets more passionate over time. Their yeah. need to learn, their need to grow. And it seems to be in short supply many times. And I'm, I'm wondering if we can't find a way in companies to make this curiosity more systemic. I, I think part of it, I agree. And I think part of it is there, there has to be a muscle built to unlearn. There has to be a fundamental humility that what I know may be dated. What I know may no longer serve me to the degree that something else I could learn. And it's why um, immigrants and refugees are so good at founding businesses and they're so good at scaling amazing business. They have had to unlearn their whole lives. They have had to leave being a doctor in their country and go start over as a waitress somewhere else and then build their way back up. And they saw their parents do that. This, this ability to unlearn, this humility, to not have to keep building on the platform you're on. And that means being comfortable with being a novice. And that means being comfortable with being bad at something. And that, that can be really scary for a mature seasoned leader who believes their identity and the trust that others have in them is rooted on them being certain. Um, and that takes a lot of work and therapy and I'm not a licensed therapist. <laughs> so I can't solve the problem. 
but the first step is acknowledging that is that there is a very um, real issue with the emotional side of how we view ourselves and what our identity is tied to. And if we believe our identity is tied to being reliable and the one who has the answers today, of course we are going to resist learning something new, being a novice. I know some leaders that have said, look, I know I need to learn that. I'm going to go take a private course. They would never want to learn or grow in public. And if you don't learn and grow in public, how do we expect to build cultures of people that are also willing to learn and grow real time under the bright light of public scrutiny and of peer observation? We have to do it ourselves first. Like great leaders don't ask others to do what they wouldn't do themselves. And so I think maybe it's because of where I came from. Um, again, my mom, just very humble beginnings that I will never forget that in the scheme of things still weren't that long ago. Um, to me, reframing fail as, and I heard this somewhere decades ago and it stuck with me, but first attempt in learning. Um, fail is not failing, it's not bad, it's just a first attempt in learning. Of course I'm not gonna be great at it, but you first have to be willing to say, I'm new to this, I'm learning it. And that there is a, the, again, the irony of courage and confidence is that it is rooted in humility and curiosity not the other way around. And so I, I hope that you know, people who see this, um, other leaders you and I have the pleasure of interacting with and continuing to learn from, is that that root of growth, the willingness to be vulnerable, the willingness to fail as first attempt in learning, um, the willingness to be on a journey to unlearn something that might have served us, that that is actually the muscle we need to build in order to address getting people to learn more and more frequently over time. Great. A couple quick questions, Kat. Yeah. First, what are you, what are you reading? What I are you reading? am, I am reading um, a couple things right now. Um, I read a mix of social media blogs and books. Um, there is a blog right now called strange new normal, and it's a series of really random and super smart individuals and thinkers sharing their experiences and what the world is going through right now and what it might mean. And it's scientists and doctors and founders and venture capitalists and executives like me. So I'm going deep in the experiences of individuals right now that are more short form. Um, I'm also constantly re-referencing Adam Grant's books, um, originals, give and take. To me, they're, they're timeless bodies of work that guide both personal and professional progress. So those are my, um, my true north of uh, reading material right now. Fabulous. Two leaders, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you most admire? Um, my mom, number one. She wouldn't consider herself a leader, but she led our family through such incredible transition She's a small business owner now and a, a leader of a small team. And um, more than anyone, she has impressed and impacted um, the way I show up every day. And another, I would say, is Mandela. Um, this concept of um, standing for a purpose, but doing so in a relatively peaceful way, but not being afraid to go the long road to create change. Um, that, that has created um, a, a level of criticism that I apply to myself in my own mind. So not necessarily what I think I could do or be, but something I use to challenge myself. And, and I would put MLK in that bucket as well, kind of an equal, am I doing enough? Am I showing up in the right way? Um, am I viewed objectively uh, as a leader that people believe is standing behind them and for them in any given circumstance and standing for a very clear purpose? So my mom is more of the, I aspire to be, uh, and the other bucket is, you know, how I, I use uh, leaders that I admire to give myself some tough love. <laughs> so a millennial or Gen Z leader comes to you and says, Kat, look back, what one thing would you tell me? If you could just tell me one thing that will help me become a better leader, shorten my trails, what one thing would you tell me as a young leader? 
I would say seek the truth and respect that that evolves over time. Um, things that are true, many of them don't age well. <laughs> and so um, I remember when I was teaching workshops, I was the head of training and development for a period of time. And I, at, whenever our, our classes, our workshops, it was teaching managers how to run restaurants. Whenever we would go on breaks, I would stay in the bathroom stall a little longer after I used the restroom so I could hear people talk. And um, I know it sounds creepy, but I never used it for ill. And I only got the women's perspective, obviously. <laughs> but, but that shows you I really wanted to hear the truth. And sometimes they talked about me as the facilitator, right? Oh, she's talking too long. Or, oh, I wish she would stop saying that. And I was so glad that I heard that. I don't want something to be out there for the taking to improve an outcome. And it's so close, but I don't know it because I don't ask or because I don't find creative ways to listen to the truth. Someone in the, um, I would overhear might say, gosh, this guy's being really disruptive in the back. I would find my own way to then discover that and address the issue. Or they would say, the snacks suck. I'm gonna fix the snacks. By the end of the day, the snacks are gonna be better. Um, and there is something about being obsessed with wanting to know people's truth, their feelings, their experience, and then being willing to change as a result, that if I think back, um, was a lot of the secret sauce and the times I didn't do it, um, that fact that I missed or that perspective of someone else that I missed was the source of something that I then later had to deal with when I, I could have been closer to it and done something about it. So um, even at a very young age, ask questions, be curious and be humble enough to let that color your thinking. And you'll grow more and faster than your peers. Kat, thank you. Thank you for taking the time this morning. Thank you for challenging our thinking. Thanks for changing our conversation. And thank you, maybe above all, for demonstrating that it's possible to create organizations that are not only more effective, but far more human. And thank you to the Washington Speakers Bureau for making this conversation possible. Kat, I hope I see you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I've loved the conversation.